there is no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end, that everything's always going to be changing. And I think the same is true for organizations, right. this idea of transformation. And we're never going to transform because the, the, the idea that, we, that we're going to get to a, a finishing point is a completely illusion. Mm -hmm. So we're always going to be transforming everything. So actually, we should just kind of get rid of the word transformation and the transformation cycle and just realize that we're on a journey. We have the pleasure of welcoming Adrian Swinsko to this episode of Ngati Engage. I'm Aishwarya Sanke from the Ngati team. Let's begin with a quick introduction. Ngati is the world's leading open, multilingual, no-code chatbot platform available across 14 channels with 25,000 bots. Created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. We run the Ngati blog and the video channel, which receives upwards of 300,000 visitors annually. And now for our guest. Adrian Swinsko is a customer service and experience advisor whose passion is to help create, develop, and grow businesses that take care of their customers in the best way possible. He conducts masterclasses at Punk CX which discusses various topics such as getting personalization right, um, understanding customer emotions and intent, and striking a balance between digital customer experience solutions and the human touch. In addition, he's also a best-selling author, Forbes contributor, blogger, and podcaster. Welcome to the show, Adrian. We're thrilled to have you. Hi, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. So let me start with my first question. So one of your masterclass topics is humans versus machines, how to strike the balance between digital customer experience solutions and the human touch. How do you think artificial intelligence and conversational agents fit into this aspect of creating valuable customer experiences? Uh, well, H, thanks for your um, one, for, first of all, for inviting me to, to participate in that. And thanks for your, you know, the, the questions. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I think the best answer to it is it depends mm -hmm. um, because the, there is an assumption that many people can make, I believe, um, that they think that AI or conversational agents are the right things to be, to be added into uh, somebody's, if you like, channel mix or their kind of the things that they offer their customers. But ultimately it depends on what your customers kind of want and also what your business wants to achieve. And so I think the question you've got to ask yourself before you think, before you get to the technology is, you know, what is the, what is the experience strategy that, uh, that you have in mind? What do you want it to deliver? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Um, and also when you've, done that, you have then got to start to think about, okay, um, and how, does your, how is your digital human mix going to change across different elements of the, of the customer's journey? Mm -hmm. um, and how does it vary across um, different customer groups? Because not all customers are made the same, right? Um, and I think once we ask ourselves those questions, um, then we start to get a better idea. Well, we should be able to get a better idea of where we think kind of AI conversational agents kind of fit into that mix. On top of that, once you've done all that, then you've also got to ask yourself. You, now you've understood what your experience strategy is, and 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 what you think that the human tech um, mix is, and where you are now, and where you would like to be in the future. Um, so that gives you a bit of a, a a roadmap, a plan of what of how you want to build things out or develop things. Then you've also got to ask yourself, well, how does this overall strategy and what we're trying to propose also fit with and support and enable the achievement of the business's overall strategy mm -hmm. and objectives? Because otherwise, if you don't do that, then it, you end up building all this stuff and it just becomes a nice to have sort of thing. And that speaks to the, 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 the idea that many professionals in this space are getting challenged by where they're they're being asked to prove the the ROI on many of their their investments and people are going what's the ROI of that and then people go uh, and 
and they get stuck because what they haven't done is they haven't really understood um, what the initiatives or the, the things that you're trying to put in place, place, how it affects the overall achievement of the business, whether it's increased sales, lower cost to serve, reduced churn, all of these different things, you know, business fundamentals that we have to kind of get right. We have to create those linkages because if we don't, then some of the, the new stuff that we do, then it shouldn't be a surprise to us that it gets challenged to prove its ROI because yeah. that's just corporate speak for somebody kind of saying in, in many cases, who the hell approved that? What is it doing? Why does it make sense? And oh my God, how quickly can we kill it? Mm -hmm. uh, because they don't understand how it all fits. And unless people who are actually kind of working kind of closely in this and, 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 and do that thinking for people and understand kind of like where it plays, what, well, what plays where and kind of why and how it helps build that overall kind of picture, then we're always going to face these kind of like these, uh, these challenges on a recurring basis. That's right. So speaking of customer experiences, do you think, um, do you think the concept of the uncanny valley exists in a field like customer service? So, so let me kind of like, let me be clear. The uncanny valley, is that the, the idea that, um, we react, uh, we have a negative react a reaction to things and particularly things that are, um, machines, yeah. the more human like they become. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, it kind of goes down and then it goes back up again. Like there's before we completely understand it, um, we do fall into this uncanny valley where we don't appreciate how human like it is. I guess. Yeah, I think the thing is that that <coughs> I think what we I, so I don't know. I think it would depend. Mm -hmm. It also depends that on the I think the idea of how explicit we are in helping people understand. Um, what it is they're dealing with. Because mm -hmm. um, I actually think many people are okay at dealing with, you know, uh, technical solutions like bots and, and other things like that, or um, voice, um, intelligent voice sort of systems, um, you know, and, and intelligent voices, particularly around like IVRs and stuff and things that you can kind of, they'll ask you kind of to say your name or your account number or whatever it might be. And they'll repeat all that sort of stuff back to you. And they'll try and do it in a, in a, in a way that tries to make it as human as possible. Now, I think the, the interesting thing is, is that if we help people and we're explicit with kind of people about what we're trying to do and why, I think that might, it might do it go a long way to kind of um, assuage people's kind of concerns. Cause I think there's a thing in the back of people's kind of like mind that drives a lot of these negative kind of like feelings, potentially negative feelings where, where they, they turn around and go, they're not really sure what they're trying to, that what they're dealing with. Right. They're not saying, is this the company trying to use a machine or something to be, to mimic a human being, or are they just using machine to help? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, one, of the, one of the challenges is that we, we end up putting in place all these, you know, particularly kind of like bots and stuff. Um, and sometimes you just need to be very, um, very straightforward around saying, this is who I am or this is what I am and this yeah. is how I'm trying to help. I think if, people, if you do that with people, I think that you, you end up um, managing those expectations. Mm -hmm. and taking away that any any kind of elements of of doubt or questions they might they might might have but i don't know if it's a problem uh or not it's not something i've necessarily come across a lot i think there's there's more of that in some of the more advanced applications particularly when you end up with robots that are very humanoid in their in their form mm -hmm. or you've got um these uh intelligent voice assistants that are becoming increasingly conversational and increasingly kind of like human-like because they're actually, um, they are rather than electronically um, generated um, in terms of the, the synthesis of the words and things, 
they, they, they're actually, they're, they're, they're pulling from um, a bunch of words that are pre-recorded from an actual kind of an actor or an actress's voice. Yeah. So they're trying to mimic the human sort of thing rather than actually being, and I've seen something, there was something that came out from Google a while ago, I think it's Google Duplex or something, where they used a simulation to try and book a, an, um, some, a real person called something like a, a hair salon or something to try and book an appointment. And they were opting for, um, they were trying to mimic a human voice as much as possible. And even putting in, you know, uh, involuntary sounds and pauses that would normally come in a human speech. So it would be like, um, or, well, you know, and, and all these different things to try and mimic that sort of thing. Now, the question is, you know, how do we feel about something that's trying to mimic? Because we know it's not human. And then we end up with this almost a bit of an irrational sort of like reaction to something that is trying to be, to trying to mimic kind of human kind of behavior. But, with, but, but then there's, we have a, sometimes we have a suspicion that it's not. Or when we find out that it's not, then it's like, pfft don't like it regardless of how it's performed because that, that becomes, it threatens our existence mm -hmm. in many ways. So, but it's not, it's right now, it's not a, um, a, a situation that I've come across with, I come across a lot. I can, I see it may become something that becomes more prevalent in the future in terms of what we do and how we do things. Mm -hmm. um, but right now I don't see a lot of it. So do you think companies should be more candid about the fact that they're implementing chatbots into their sort of, um, into their system, I guess? Um, I, I, I would suggest so. I, I would say that um, I don't think it can, I don't think it, it can, um, it can hurt sort of thing. It's almost a bit like, um, it's a bit like somebody saying, if you end, ended up a, in, in a chatbot situation where you kind of, you open up a window and you're, you're, engagement with, with, with a chatbot, particularly um, that it's not necessarily for customers that are very digitally savvy and sometimes more um, technologically um, well-versed, but maybe some customers that are not so, and they're learning about this mm -hmm. to be explicit about, Hey, I'm a, um, a, a, a chatbot and um, clever piece of technology that's here to try and kind of help you get some, you know, answers as quickly as possible. However, if there comes a if there becomes comes a point when um, when I'm not able to help you or your question is is too complex that that you know we will pass you on or I will pass you on to to um, an agent who will help address your um, your your question directly or be able to solve your kind of problem. So it's almost that sort of thing around being explicit around um, you're not left alone here. There are solutions. There are kind of ways, 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 you know, to um, to do that. Now, would that um, would that matter? Would it count? Would it help manage expectations? Yeah, maybe. Um, would it hurt to add something like that in? I'm not sure. It probably it probably would. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, 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 it might add something, but it wouldn't necessarily cost very much. Mm -hmm. in terms of effort or re, you know additional design elements and things so um, i you know uh, it's a really interesting question but it's i think that the, the key thing around um all of this is about not just relying on the technology but also managing uh, people's adoption of the technology mm -hmm. so and helping them understand it yeah so it's kind of about telling them, but also making the bot recognize when it's not able to help and being able to seamlessly sort of transition from a chatbot to a live agent when needed. Completely. I think that's, that's absolutely, absolutely key. I mean, I think the, um, is, again, it comes back to that original question is like, how do you strike the critical balance as it were, mm -hmm. you know, you go, well, we're going to, we're going to use a, um, a, a very clever kind of chatbot to help solve some of the most, some of the most regular and straightforward kind of queries that our customers have um, to try and one facilitate 
them getting answers as quickly as possible. Yes. You know, because that's a good thing for them. But at the same time, where it does, it frees us, frees up time and resources for us. So it, you know, unclogs lines and everything else, and it frees up convergence kind of time. So then they can deal with more some of the more complex kind of queries. However, um, making sure that you can connect those two things because sometimes something what might might feel like a simple query, there are kind of times that when as you dig into it, it becomes either the customer doesn't really understand how to explain it or their query is more complex than it sounds on, the, in, in, on, on a first look. And they need that sort of that transition and that, and that help. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it's, it comes down to, you know, helping the customer solve the problem that they have in the moment. Um, and more often than not, I think the thing to kind of bear in mind is, you know, if, if we think about the um, the the distribution of 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 queries follows probably follows something a little bit like a, a, you know it's probably like a skewed bell curve. It's probably like this, or it's probably like that, mm. as it were. And most of the problems that we have, the ones that we talk about, whether because they're great or talk about because they're bad, they happen on the edges. They don't happen in the ma this major, this this bit where where sort of like you know eighty five percent, ninety percent of all queries can like sit. Yeah. The things where the things where we fall um, we fall down is the, the is the bits in you know the in extremis as it were things that are really good or things that are really bad and it's the people that 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 focus on those kind of like the scenarios where. Um, things can get difficult or complicated and getting that, 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 that interplay between technology and, and the human touch, getting that right yeah. so that they all feel uh, well served uh, so that everybody feels well served, I think is absolutely key. Oh yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, I feel like right now there's a lot of extremes where some people are either completely pro technology or some people are completely pro the human aspect, but there's no one who really wants to be in the middle where there, there's no like sort of middle ground, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that, the, um, I mean, um, quite frankly, I'm, I don't really care about, I mean, I, I kind of describe myself as, um, um, what do I say? I say, I'm a lover of simplicity and the human touch with a really useful bit of technology thrown in. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that it should be all this or all that, I don't really care about the, you know, the, the mix that different companies have. I'm not advocating for a particular kind of mix. All I'm advocating for is producing better outcomes for both customers and also their people. So if you can do things that can help you know, service agents or reps or support people to do their job in, in, in the best way possible and give them the tools to do that and the right sort of infrastructure around that to do that, and at the same time, we can help uh, customers solve their problems in the quickest, easiest, most easily understood kind of like way possible. And we get that balance right between kind of like um, about human with about people and and technology in the blend, um, both inside and outside a, 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 an organization. Then that's going to be a good thing. Yeah. So I'm I'm not a. Um, I'm not really on either side. I'm more interested in what the outcomes are because I know that kind of things will change and it, it, depending on kind of who you are and, and what you want to achieve. Yes, I agree with you. So moving on to my next question, how do you think the customer service landscape has changed from the offline era to today's AI based online models? How do you think the customer service landscape has changed? Well, I mean, it's changed. I mean, the, I guess, um, you can use, well, I'll give you one data point. There is a guy called, um, I think he's called Scott Brinker, and he runs this um, thing. He's, um, he runs this kind of, he does this thing called a MarTech landscape thing. And he looks at the amount of different brands that are in that marketing technology space, which you would kind of put, customer experience and so service and support as part of that um, as a way of tracking the number of different players. 
Mm -hmm. I think the last look, there are somewhere in the region of about seven and a half thousand, well, more than seven and a half thousand kind of like brands that operate in that space, like vendors that are operating in that sort of space. I mean, so the difference is, is huge is like, it's, you know, and it's, it's developing at a, at a fast, at such a fast pace. It's sometimes it's hard to keep up and people have, you know, particularly people in organizations, they have so much choice around what sort of tools and technology that they can they can use but it's almost a bit like i find that kind of many people are choosing to use things because they think it's the right thing to do um but they're it, they think it's the right thing to do because everybody else is doing it so they're following the crowd as right. it were and you end up with all this kind of like stuff around it's like a me too type of you know, so, sort of, you know, I should rephrase, it's not a me too, it's like a follow, follow me sort of like strategy because the me too is like a completely different issue, kind of like hashtag sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, it's like a, um, everybody's being, um, is like following the crowd, yes. if you know what I mean. And so if you ask kind of people on this, you can say, well, so what is it, what sort of experience do you want to create? And there is like, every, you know, you get lots of people that are talking about, oh, we want to create this omni-channel, digital, seamless, kind of friction-free, kind of connected experience. You're like going, yeah, well, if everybody's saying the same thing, mm -hmm. then where's the difference? Is it really unique? Well, it's not. I mean, particularly if you kind of, if you, if you think about it, that most people agree that the, the, the difference that exists between products and services is, is converging all the time. And actually service and experience is the thing that differentiates kind of people. But if everybody's trying to do and achieve the same thing, this digital omnichannel, frictionless, seamless, connected sort of experience, it's like going, well, I'm pretty sure we're at, you're going to end up with this, you know, homogenous gloop of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, is to is actually to get people to really think about what is it they the um, that they want to do and why. Because um, there is no doubt that things are changing kind of fast, um, and the amount of choice that we have to to change things is 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 changing all of, all you know all all of the time, but. Um, What's interesting is that we, we, there seems to be a lack of, um, of bravery, of courage, of being able to really, really think hard about what brands want to do and, and, and why, and what is it going to, what is going to be the service and experience, experience element as part of their, their proposition that's going to help them stand out. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, actually. So do you think we've reached the stage where customer centricity and service is given the importance it deserves? If not, how do you create a customer centric work culture? So I think there's a difference between, um, there's a lot of talk. And a lot of it's, I think a lot of it's still rhetoric. A lot of people kind of like um, turning around and saying, oh, we, we want to build a customer centric organization. And you go, okay, fine. But then you have to ask yourself, ask yourself a question and say, okay, um, if we want a, and a customer centric kind of culture and organization, the, to do that, you have to ask yourself a, a, a bunch of fundamental questions. One is that if you want to take like an outside in approach to things, you want to be driven by your customers in the market and things. So if you, cause outs, outside in thinking is, is a, a fundamental part of being customer centric or customer focused right. but you have to ask yourself if you want to be outside in and you're thinking is your organization built to be outside in or inside out mm -hmm. you know are you taking for example a customer typology of demand i this is kind of what our customers kind of like are saying that they want and are you trying to then fit that into your organizational typology of how you deal with customer demand or are you building your organization to deal with what customers kind of want at the point of demand? 
Right. Most organizations say they're outside in thinking or they're customer centric, but they're still structured in a, in, in a very traditional way. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So it's a huge challenge. I mean, it's like going, how do you kind of build that? Well, I think it starts with um, how do you, how do you construct the system that you want to, that, that, so how do you construct a system that's going to allow you to deliver the, you know, the outcomes that you want to uh, deliver to your customers and that your customers kind of want. And, and when you examine kind of many, um, many organizations, they're not, they're not constructed to really deliver that. And that's where you end up with all this kind of like problems and friction mm-hmm. that creates because the responsiveness and the adaptability they need to to, um, to to deal with kind of changing customer requirements butts up against how they're how they're structured, and so this the system. If you create the system, that you end up create you you will you will do you go a long way towards creating the culture. Do you think improving employee culture and employee experience will end up boosting customer experience? Oh, I do think that the um, there is a uh, there is a clear link between um, the employee experience and customer experience. I think it it makes no sense. It doesn't follow that you'd say that you know you treat your employees like crap and you don't give them the right sort of tools and 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 resources to do a good job. That and then then you expect them to do a good job. That's really hard to pull off. And pull off in a sustainable way. But if you if you help your people do the right things at the right time for the right reasons and equip them with all the right sort of tools and resources to do that, there is a very, very good chance if you have the right sort of people with the right sort of like kind of training, the right sort of aptitudes and and, 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 and attitudes and the right sort of behaviors, that they will do their utmost to deliver the right sort of experience for the for the customers. Mm-hmm. So they are completely they are completely kind of linked. But again, it comes back to that it's not just about the people and the and the employee experience. The employee experience is part of that system mm-hmm. that you have to build. So, what do you believe will be the new normal after this pandemic? How do you believe customer service and support are going to change after the crisis? So, I think that the the the, the, uh, the things that here's the things I would hope. Um, I would hope that um, the pandemic has, has accelerated people's thinking in terms of um, how they can use digital technology to help them solve some of these kind of problems mm-hmm. uh, and manage some of the demand, how it creates, uh, how much extra content that needs to get created that's going to build those knowledge bases, whether they're FAQs or an intelligent, you know, search function or, you know, that, that, that acts as, um, as, as, as data for the use of a chatbot that can help customers um, find the answers that, 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 that they want uh, when they want them, mm-hmm. um, which then ends up, ends up deflecting that um, or a lot of the, the mundane, repetitive sort of like stuff. That happens again and again. I think on um, is part of that. I also think that will you know the best brands will have learned that they need to communicate more and be better at communicating with their customers. Mm-hmm. Um, and they need to be re- and and also they will then grasp the nettle and start to be a bit more proactive. With, you know, with, with with their customers, and that's sort of almost in the outside. On the on the inside. I think that hopefully we're going to learn that um, we'll have a reappreciation of the value that service and support personnel deliver to an organization. Because mm-hmm. there's, you know, people that I have always thought that people that work in service and support teams, they're, you know, more often than not, they are, they're heroes and heroines um, in our midst. And they don't necessarily get the recognition and the support that they, de- that, that they deserve. And they are under, some of them are under sort of 
profound amounts of kind of like stress and pressure right now to, to deal with unprecedented levels of demands. But they are battling. They are battling a way to do a good job. And, that, and, and we need to recognize that. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. Because let me, t- let me tell you a story. And it's a story I've been telling um, kind of over the last couple of months because it's, it, it's just it's absolutely stuck with me. And it's kind of quite left field, but it, uh, I'll tell you it anyway. So uh, back in, I think it was January or so, um, January or February, and I was watching the BAFTAs, BAFTA Awards ceremony here in the UK. And it's like a precursor to the, it's the UK version of Film and TV Awards. It's almost a, it, it, so like a precursor to the Oscars oh, yeah. in, Holly, in Hollywood. So the person that won the, the best male actor this year was Joaquin Phoenix for his part in uh, the, the new Joker film. Mm-hmm. And so he, he got up and made a speech and he turned around and he said, look, um, he said, I am, it, I paraphrase, he basically said, I am appalled at the lack of diversity and inclusion that we see even now, you know, in the nominations and the winners and everything else. He said, you know, and he says, I know I'm part of the problem. Mm-hmm. He said, he says, no, that, that should not stop us advocating f- uh, for change wherever we see discrimination or injustice or unfairness or lack of diversity or inclusion or all that. We should not. We should always, always, always be, um, we should always have the opportunity to, to call that sort of stuff out. And everybody should have that opportunity. He says, however, here's the thing. He said, we must also recognize that, um, and those that are at the heart of this also have to recognize that nothing will change until those that built the system change the system. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true here. Is, you know, even though we know it, oh, we can recognize that you know we should these people should get more respect and everything else. Our problem is is that our instinct is that when things when the when the crisis is over, we might be like this elastic band that we snap back into a normality and, and what was normal and new normal is like a is like a dream, mm-hmm. right? And our, our our transition from what was normal into a new normal, a new way of kind of doing and operating is only going to be facilitated by the people that kind of built and run the system Mm -hmm. in terms of how people kind of like, particularly senior management and how they want to run their, run their companies and also investors and shareholders and stakeholders and all those different sort of things. So what, so we shouldn't stop advocating for that change, but we also need to understand the limits of our, of our power, but we also still need to continue to advocate. Yes, I agree with you. I saw that speech. I thought it was phenomenal. Yeah, no, it just struck with me because it says it has parallels in so many places. Oh, yeah. It really, it touched a lot of people's hearts. I know that for sure. Especially, um, yeah, it was just a phenomenal speech. So my next question is, do you believe chatbots and conversational experience design will play a significant role in the future? Um, and how and where in the business transformation cycle would you see them fit? Okay. So I'm going to take the first part of your, uh, the second part of your question first, and then I'll answer the, 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 the first part. Um, so the, I think the, 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 the first thing I would say about the, um, the second part of your question is I wish people would stop talking about business transformation <laughs> because it's bunk. Mm-hmm. It's nonsense. I mean, like transform to what? You know, you know, transform implies we're going to be finished. Mm-hmm. But that's a complete illusion. We're never going to be finished with this. And if I go back to the thing I was saying before, is like you talk about the, the change between, this, um, for between, let's say, 25, 30 years ago, between when everything was broadly offline, digital did, didn't really exist to now. The, the change is, is phenomenal and it's still, change, it's still kind of like, it's still developing. 
you know, that, that idea that, you know, we've now got more than seven and a half thousand kind of different vendor um, providers in the, the MarTech sort of space alone is just like <laughs> crumbs. It's like how the, that, that curve, that the development of the population of that, the, the population growth in that curve is didn't stop. It's not going to stop. Mm-hmm. So we're not transforming to anything. Right. And so actually, I think we need to take a bit more of a, um, um, I have this, I wrote about this in, in the, the last book, sort of Punk CX, which there's, there's, a, um, there's a song from a punk band called Bad Religion um, that's called No Control. Right. And they have a line in the song and it, it, it goes, there's no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. Mm-hmm. Now that quote, I thought that's that's really interesting. So I looked it up, and actually, it came about. It was a quote from a book by the name by a gentleman by the name of uh, James Hutton in the 1780s, who wrote um, the first recognized uh, treatise on geology, and it's called the Theory of Earth. Mm-hmm. And what he did is he went around sort of studying, you know hills and mountains and rivers and streams and lakes and coastlines and all these different sort of things. And just to try and understand how the earth came to be formed. Right. And he concluded in all of that, there is no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end, that everything's always going to be changing. And I think the same is true for organizations, right. this idea of transformation. And we're never going to transform because the, the, the idea that, we, that we're going to get to a, a finishing point is a completely illusion. Mm-hmm. So we're always going to be transforming everything. So actually we should just kind of get rid of the word transformation and the transformation cycle and just realize that we're on a journey. It's everything's going to change and it's all about adapt adaptability and evolution. Right. And it comes back to that Darwinian sort of like theory. It's like, it's not really about the kind of the survival of the fittest. It's not about that at all. It's about survival, survival of the most adaptable. Yeah, I agree with you. And that is, that's kind of what Darwin's key thing was. It's like, when you can, like some of these dinosaurs were, they were enormous, kind of fit and kind of like, you know, like ferocious kind of cre- uh, creatures. And yet, poof, they just kind of like, they, you know, they, some of them, some of their, their ancestors survived, but many of them didn't because they weren't adaptable. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what the thing we need to do is we need to think about adaptability and responsive, uh, responsiveness and, um, and, and, and evolution rather than kind of transformation. Now, right. some, some people might say that that's, that's implicit in kind of our, our conversation about transformation. I said, yes, but we also need to kind of consider the linguistic and you know, uh, psychological impact of using the word trans, you know, transformation mm-hmm. and what it implies to people. And what it, what it, what they make it mean both at a conscious and also subconscious kind of basis. So I think that's kind of one thing. So I would say, can we stop talking about that? Because also research shows that most of these big projects that are labeled transformational, they fail. Mm-hmm. They fail to, they fail to kind of meet their objectives um, and meet expectations. So we should just stop doing it. And we should start doing lots of kind of like little things that, you know, that aren't, that are more evolutionary and kind of that. So we're all constantly kind of changing. And that's the thing that we've got to get people used to um, rather than actually going, da-da, big change, big change, big change, you right. know? But so that aside, if we think about the, um, the, the, the first part of your questions, um, is do I think kind of the chatbots and conversational experience design will play a significant role in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, um, it's, and I think they're all, we're already seeing lots of successes in this sort of space. We're also, but we're also seeing lots of failures as well. And I think that's, you know, for various reasons that people are, um, the failures, I think a lot of it are, are, are driven by, um, the, Many technology is over-promising and under-delivering. People are, some of the people are being lazy buyers 
and that they want to buy something and then plug it in and then play and then expect they don't have to do any hard work on the back end of it because they don't realize that actually many of these these models it, they need data and they need training and then they need maintenance and managing and all that sort of like stuff and they're like going oh you know I didn't that wasn't clear to me they kind of want they almost like they want a shortcut that's going to um you know make their life easier or give them more kind of like free time you're like mm, i'm sorry that's not strictly true because when you plug some of this sort of stuff in this is the unspoken part of many of these many ai driven sort of technologies is that it needs maintenance and it needs management and it needs content kind of uh, generation and it needs analytics and it needs kind of like tweaking and everything else it's not just a then they plug it and go off you go and like have a nice life sort of thing and so it's becoming a reality people are starting to kind of figure out kind of that actually this is it can really help but it also adds it has requirements of its own resource requirements of its own to keep it going and to get the results out of it but also from a design perspective the people that kind of that handle things and make things as simple as possible and then build up from there um, is are the ones that I think are, and particularly how they construct their models and how what problems they're focusing on solving, are the ones that are that um, I think are are seem to be having more success than other ones that are trying to build this super fancy super bot, all seeing all dancing sort of thing, and because that's where the challenges become, uh, and it looks like that's where a lot of the challenges sit. Right, right. So I have one final question for you. And okay. Just, are there any other thoughts that you'd like to leave our viewers with? Any sound bites of any sort? So one, one I would say is that um, simplicity is something to strive for. Um, and we should always be striving for it mm -hmm. because it pays. You know, uh, it makes it things easy, um, make, it makes things easier for um, us as employees as, or, or us as kind of customers. We like simple things. Even though we tell ourselves that we like choice, in actual fact, choice confuses us. It's overwhelming. It, it is overwhelming. And, it, and research shows that the more choice you give us, the less that we do. Right. And, but the, so the less, uh, the less choice that, we, um, that we, we give ourselves, it might be less interesting, but we're more likely to do stuff with it. So here's the challenge. The challenge is, if you are going to add something to your mix, as it were, or to your tool set, or whatever it is, ask yourself this. If I'm going to add this, what two things am I going to take away? Because if you don't take those two things away, then all you're doing is you're either maintaining the level of complexity or adding to it. Right. So that's one of the challenges that we have is that we kind of have is we keep adding things without thinking about taking things away. Mm -hmm. And so final thought is like, there's an old piece of research. It's a couple of years old, but it's, it's, um, I think it's still, um, it's still useful. It was like, comes from dimension data. They did a big benchmark sort of like, um, study. And they said back in, I think it was in, uh, 2017 and 2018, they said that um, that most organizations, most large organizations, were serving their customers over at that point about nine different channels. Mm -hmm. And they said that number, they said that that number of channels was was set to increase to about 11 right. over the course of the, the, the next 18 months. So up to about right now, people could keep adding, adding, adding kind of channels. However. Um, they also found out that only at that time, only about 8% of all companies said that they had all of those channels connected. Mm -hmm. And so what that was doing is they were adding sort of stuff without connecting them, trying to simplify the, the whole thing or integrate the whole sort of thing. So you end up with this kind of like um, unconnected, kind of like lumpy, kind of experience and customers are like, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. But that's, those are averages, right? right? But if you think about the companies around the world 
that we hold out to be the leaders in service and experience. I am pretty sure, if you kind of think about it, most of those companies don't serve their, they only probably serve their channels over probably five channels. They might keep adding them, but they also keep, they keep, thing, keep taking them away. They also kind of understand that this simplicity idea requires us to make choices and hard choices. But they also understand that they, uh, this idea is like, it's better to be great at a few things than average at a lot. Right. Because they also kind of, they're, they're also kind of like understand that we know that customers will pay for better service and better experience, right? But we also know that they will travel for it as well. Mm -hmm. And here's the key. They will travel for it both physically and digitally. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none type thing. Absolutely. So right. the idea is like, and, you know, why would you kind of, so there's, there is idea we have to be where our customers are. You're like, mm, yeah, maybe. Actually, you might want to be, close to where your customers are, but be great at what you're kind of, you know, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then your customers kind of hear about it. And if they, they, they'll go, oh, we'll travel because we're going to get, knock it out of the park service over there. Right. Something that's more worthwhile. So it's, it becomes this thing. It's like, what's the, what's the proposition? I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to get average over here and long call wait times and everything else. Or I'm going to get, knock it out of the park over here, which is going to require me to, to travel a couple of streets over, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, that all requires it requires it the, requires the thinking and the strategy and the kind of the, the design and and the choice and all of that sort of like sort of stuff. But it's uh, ultimately it's about focus and about choices and about drilling down on this idea of like you know keeping things simple. I completely agree with you. Um, yeah, this was great. I learned a lot about customer experience. And well, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, so this concludes our interview with Ngati Engage. So I just want to say thank you one more time for talking to us and sharing your insight and your expertise on the subject. And yeah, that's it. Aisha, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.